Hi, everybody. It's good to be here with you all. I'm on unceded Ohlone land here in Berkeley, now known as, and I want to celebrate all the good Dharma activities that San Francisco Dharma Activity is doing, Dharma Collective is doing. <laughs> and thank you, Pam, for all those announcements. And I'm glad that um, the events are accessible to all, and it is nice in a way, you know, it's sad that we're taking a break for the month of July for the most part, but it's also a great opportunity for you to branch out and try other classes here uh, that you might have been curious about. So that sounds fun to me. So many good teachers, different perspectives, and I love, I always have loved the SFDC's uh, kind of cutting edge approach, openness to kind of sometimes uh, not fringe, but, you know, edgy, different ways of integrating the Dharma. So I feel very proud to be a part of that. <laughs> and uh, it's a great community, the jewel of the Sangha, rare, precious jewel. So thank you all. It's good to be here with you. And our dear Eve, you know, I texted her. I was like, hey, do you want to teach tonight? I can do it if you can't do it. But I'm sure they'd love to see you. And she's like, oh, I wish I could do it. But literally, she's working from like morning, noon, and night every day here for a while on a project. And uh, I think that that will kind of wind down at the end of July. So, what we've decided to do is take a little break because I'm also going into retreat on the 29th of June for three weeks. And Eve is also um, quite busy, as I mentioned. So we thought, you know, let's take an exhale, and and uh, and then we'll we'll take an inhale in August. And so I'm sure people are maybe even traveling a little bit, or spending family time, or going off on retreat too. So hopefully this is supportive for you in different ways, seen and unseen. And so I wanted to, what I did is I shared a little link. My last event before I go into retreat is this Saturday from three to five Pacific time. It's our Wisdom Rising monthly course, and it's just really rich, a beautiful time to, to meditate together, to chant together, to listen to stories, and, and uh, be in Sangha with Nina Rao and I. She's a beautiful kirtan um, leader, you could say. And uh, she'll talk about uh, one of my favorite prayers that she teaches that lists the beautiful different names of the goddess uh, Durga from the Hindu tradition, but also in many different beautiful expressions that overlap some of the Buddhist goddesses, especially Tara. And so I'll tease out some of those overlaps and similarities. And that's the theme for this Saturday. Usually we meet on Sundays, but this week we have to do Saturday. Everyone's welcome to that. So I'd love to begin with the meditation so we can drop in and nourish ourselves with some practice before we engage in our next slogans, our mind training slogans after we meditate. So please take a moment and find a comfortable position. You know, listening to your body and responding. What does the body feel, want right now, upright, supine, a high cushion, a low cushion, kind of let go of any rules or shoulds, and really listen to the body, respect the body, and find a, that special spot, and then close your eyes, and begin to take some deep breaths. Notice any layers of tension where you might be holding tension from your day and breathe into it and release with the out breath. You might notice a little layer of tension in the face or the jaw. See if you can soften that area. Let the jaw go slack. Draw the chin in towards the center of the throat to lengthen the back of the neck. You may find that when there's this 
Release through the base of the skull, right where it meets the occiput, the top of the neck. And that space releases and opens. You may find a natural breath deepening the response in the lungs. Shoulders relaxing down the back, the arms soft, and yet the chest is buoyant. Belly soft, and the spine nice and strong. Hips relax, the legs in a comfortable position. And then feel the pelvis. You can even rock it forward and back a little bit, releasing any tension through the sacrum or low back or hips. And then slowly come to a nice balanced pelvis, like your pelvis is a fishbowl filled with water to the brim, and you don't want to tilt it too forward, too back. Nice, balanced, equal weighted pelvis, the sits bones rooted on the cushion, allows the spine to have a natural S-curve going up, aligned with gravity. Just feel the beauty of a simple integral seat and enjoy that. Take a moment now to arouse your motivation. We always begin our practice by taking a moment to root and pull forth our heartfelt motivation for our life and our practice. Feel that expansiveness open as we add the, the phrase, for the benefit of all beings. May I be more patient for the benefit of friends, family, myself, all beings. May I find my joy liberated from my sorrow so I may be a benefit in the world. This is the bodhicitta prayer. Now let's drop into some breath awareness as an anchor. Just feeling the natural in and outflow of the breath. Counting helps. We'll count from 1 to 21 as a stabilizing concentration practice. The top of the in-breath, the silent, gentle count of one. Natural outflow. Again, as you breathe in at the top of the next breath, count two, and so on. Releasing tension with each out-breath, and gently releasing distraction and returning. The flow of the sensations of the breath in and out of the body. Practice in silence, one to 21 breaths.
You know, from this foundation of shamatha, calm abiding, without losing that presence of the breath, take a step further with me in the practice of tonglen, the practice of giving and taking coordinated with the breath, the heartbeat of the lojong mind training practices. In Tonglen, we use the power of the imagination to engage with realities beyond our immediate experience. We can feel that the enactment of loving kindness of metta is the giving component of the practice, meaning the out breath. And taking is the enactment of compassion with the in breath. And so let's feel the breath in the body. And just first working with texture of the flow of the in breath and the out breath. And as you breathe in, feel that the breath is drawing directly full 360 degrees around you, directly into this luminous sun at your heart center. And then breathing out from that orb of light, this orb of light is your awakened nature, your Buddha nature. expression of awakened mind, heart, compassion. Each in-breath, it's like we're aerating, oxygenating that luminosity at the heart center. You can even feel it kind of flares up with the in-breath. Sparkles. And then the out-breath, the release of a cool, clear breeze. And now with the next in-breath, feel that you're drawing in like a, a cloudy, smoky vapor. It has some density to it, like fog, breathing it in where it evaporates at the luminosity at your heart. And then breathing out, a release, a clearing, a cool breeze, luminous. So breathing in a texture of cloudy vapor, breathing out a clear, cool breeze, light. Each breath you're oxygenating, empowering, enlivening this bodhicitta of your heart, this luminous, wakeful nature that lies within each and every one of us. diamond-like nature of mind that is unhindered, unchanged by adventitious circumstances. And then add on to this texture of the breath any feelings of dis-ease or discomfort within you. So we'll start with the Donglen, with the self. What have you brought with you here today, this inner atmosphere? Have you had a hard day? You're feeling down and out, agitated, it's working with any challenges you might have carried with you here and feel any, any of that feeling of discontent or discomfort, draw it in with the in-breath in the form of a dark, smoky vapor. That draw into the heart where it's transformed and breathe out a cool feeling of release and space, letting go, a remedy perhaps. Breathing in the so-called challenge into the heart space, let it come home. And breathe out the integration, the release of the struggle. 
In a sense, it's like you're welcoming that home and letting it feel whole again. These aspects we exile. Breathe in, receiving. Breathe out, giving. Breathing in is a compassionate act, letting this come home. Be integrated in the breathing out is a loving kindness act of offering, may you be well, free of suffering. So practice like this with the self. About 10 more breaths. Now from this basis of bodhicitta, a bit more care and compassion for ourselves, now we branch out to working with a loved one, or even a community of people whom you care about deeply who might be suffering. So either an individual or a group. Cause of their suffering may be physical, psychological, or social, or environmental. So for a moment, empathetically enter into the suffering of this person or group. Put yourself in their shoes. And imagine experiencing the burden of their adversity. And then now, in your mind's eye, stand back, coming back into your own body, your own situation. See them in front of you and bring forth the wish, may you be relieved of this burden. And may this adversity ripen upon me. So whatever the affliction or adversity, physical or mental, imagine with the in-breath taking this from this person, their despair, their affliction, their pain. And imagine the suffering in the form of the black cloud being removed from the other person's body and mind and being drawn into your heart imagine that as the suffering is funneled into your heart, transforming it, the luminosity at your heart, and then breathe out, offering the remedy, a wish, may you be free of suffering. With each breath, this person is gradually relieved.
Another aspect of this practice is also that as soon as this smoky cloud enters your heart, imagine that it meets your own feeling of suffering, your own disconnect or pain that's parallel to this person or group. And visualize it as an orb of darkness within you and feel that in an instant both the cloud of their misery and your own self-centeredness or suffering mutually extinguish each other, leaving not a trace of either behind. Breathing into the heart space, breathing out a healing, release of suffering. And now imagine on the other hand, now that all of your merit, all of your prosperity, happiness, all the blessings in your life from the past, present, and future, as a powerful wellspring of brilliant white light emanating from your heart in the reverse direction, Imagine these powerful rays of light reaching out and suffusing the person with the prayer, all that is good in my life, my possessions, my happiness, my good health, my virtues of the past, present, and future, I offer to you. May you be well and happy. May your greatest yearnings and deepest aspirations be fulfilled. And imagine that this light of healing and virtue and happiness begins to suffuse the person or people you've brought to mind and imagine their most meaningful desires and aspirations being fulfilled. And yet as this light from your heart flows forth unimpededly, it is not depleted from its inexhaustible source, bodhicitta at your heart. Infinite supply of luminosity, of healing rays. Now the next step is to focus on a person or group who is deluded and acts in harmful ways to themselves and others, so-called enemy. 
challenging person again you practice taking this burden upon yourself you're not literally doing this shift into this exploration of what would it feel like to be willing to do this and imagine their delusion or other mental afflictions such as anger resentment or craving and bring forth the yearning may you be relieved of the terrible burden of delusion and affliction and imagine that the mental afflictions in the form of a cloudy vapor are drawn from that person or persons and taken into your heart where it evaporates is transformed at that luminosity at your heart together with your own sense of suffering of self-centeredness and as before imagine that transforming, liberated, and sending forth all of your virtue, your compassion, your wisdom, and generosity in the form of radiant, purifying, cool, clear light. And this light suffuses this being or group with the aspiration. All that is good in my life, I offer to you. May your most meaningful aspirations be fulfilled. Feel how this is for you. The imaginary realm to imagine what it would be like to be willing to inhale and take the burden off of the so-called enemy. Transform it at your heart and breathe out the fulfillment of all of their meaningful aspirations, your deepest wishes. Freedom from suffering, safety, abundance, love. Recognizing that hate cannot conquer hate, only love can do that. See if you can crack open this heart that might still be resisting and just feel a glimmer of that capacity. Of the receiving with the in-breath, relieving the burden of the other, transforming it and sending out the offering, sending of love, compassion, understanding, freedom. Now expanding your practice of Tonglen to take in all the suffering and mental afflictions and send forth all your virtue and goodness. 
Let your mind rove throughout your environment, throughout the world, alighting upon an individual, a community, or a nation, one after another. And during each inhalation, imagine taking in the burden of suffering and the sources of that suffering. And with each exhalation, imagine rays of white or clear, luminous, cool light emerging from your heart the healing, blessing, sending out with the out breath illuminates wherever you attend to. Now draw your awareness into your own body and imagine the radiant white light of virtue and joy emanating from your heart and suffusing your entire body. Imagine your body so full of light that that light cannot be contained and the rays are emitted from every pore of your body in all directions. And now we'll conclude our Tonglen with a dedication of merit of positive energy from this practice. I'll offer a classic dedication prayer. By this merit, may every sentient being gain liberation from suffering and the sources of suffering. May the deepest yearning of each being be fulfilled.
Well, there are many ways to practice Tonglen. It's nice to, for you to have a kind of a little toolbox of different approaches of Tonglen so that you develop a sense of uh, versatility, right? What is needed right now? Maybe you have an affinity of one way over another. This is from uh, um, uh, my mentor, Alan Wallace's book, Buddhism with an Attitude, a very classic way of guiding the practice with some of my own wording put in there. I think it's an interesting one. We don't often do this. So I, it's not very, um, prevalent in, in the approaches that I've learned, but I appreciate it, this feeling of breathing in the suffering of another, and it actually meets the kind of similar kind of suffering that I may have in myself, and that those are both kind of like they join and then they're liberated, and then the out-breath is this cool release of that suffering remedy. I wonder how that felt for you. And this one's a little more edgy than I tend to to guide it, you know, that's an interesting and I feel into my own resistance in terms of, you know, I can do certain things with my own practice, I, I understand why we do these, this Donglin alchemy. Um, but I feel I notice in myself a little hesitancy of inviting others to go to that edge. And I'm also curious how that is for you, meaning the edge of really being willing to take on to imagine i am breathing in the suffering of others and breathing in the uh, suffering of, a, of an enemy it's it really takes a certain degree of understanding of what it is we're doing and what it is we're not doing here that when you when you when you understand it and really drop into the intelligence of that it can often surprise us the gifts that it gives or our own capacities that we have within us and then there's an invitation if there's resistance there to ask who is that who's resisting you know who is that where does that come from what is the belief system there what is the thought the fear perhaps or the apprehension it's not good or bad it just get curious about that yeah please mace pamela when we were doing when you during the practice it reminded me of that story of angulimala do you know that story chandra angulimala uh, um, i don't know angulimala Oh, yes, the Angela Mala? Yeah. The finger? Yeah, uh, maybe you'll tell that, maybe you could, if you want, tell that story. No, you tell it, you tell it. It's well, I don't know it super well, but there was this practitioner in, back in the day and um, during Buddha's time. And uh, he was like up to like murdering people for this particular reason that he had about some kind of debt. He thought he had to get all these fingers in order to pay off his debt. It was like this whole thing. And um, so he was just after it, like certain, um, like he was doing it and it was stressing everyone out because obviously here comes like the serial murder and he's super dedicated because he has this whole rationale. And um, someone tells the Buddha about it and the Buddha's like, oh, and uh, is like immediately like, this is no good. But the Buddha being the Buddha, right? Has all this compassion and everything and understanding. And so, and fearlessness, that's just, I love this story. And so the Buddha's like, oh, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta go meet up with Angulimala. And so, and everyone's like, no, because of course no one wants him to go, because they're fearful for him to get killed. Um, and he's venerated and everything. So, but he goes because he's the Buddha. And and then he meets Angulimala. And please, this is the important, this is an important moment that I just reflect on a lot, especially with Tong Lin. Because like, here comes the Buddha, right? He's like rolling in and then here's Angulimala. And like Angulimala is like, just like trying to go after the Buddha. Because, you know, he's like, God, this idea he's gonna get his finger. Like he doesn't care it's the Buddha or whatever, right? He's just after the fingers. Um, 
and then but he can't like get to the buddha and my understanding is because the bodhicitta of the buddha is so the field around him was so dense with like compassion and love and understanding and just like wisdom that like it was just causing angulimala to like he couldn't penetrate that field because of his his energy wasn't as clarified right and he was just like running and running and, and i just remember this part where he says like stop like he says to the buddha to stop you know and the buddha's just standing there at this point and the buddha's like no you stop and then has some kind of conversation like i think that was an important like consciousness exchange moment between buddha and angulimala the little stop comments um but then the and then the Angulimala guy just all of a sudden gets the realization and is like, oh, I have been totally deluded. And then, you know, and then he supplicates to the Buddhist teachings and Buddha's like, you know, energy and is like, oh, I gotta kind of, you know, make amends for my ways or, or whatever. The story goes on. I don't really know. But it, it reminded me that came to me when we were doing the practice tonight of like, oh, it is that way, right? Because you have your heart center all with the radiant bodhicitta light. Um, and then you're inviting like the uh, more encumbered energetic qualities mm -hmm. that you encounter in your life in the form of like people, places and things or whatever. And as that energy like comes in, you know, then it like, it has this alchemical exchange with that um, energy of bodhicitta. So, uh, uh, so that's what I wanted to share about. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a great story. Didn't he wear the fingers as a mala? That's why he's called Angali Mala because he's. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, because he's kind of trophies of how many people he had killed. But thank you for presencing that story. I haven't thought of that story in ages, and it's so memorable. And it is, and that is what we're doing. It's like we have this field of love that will start to transform ourselves and our life, but those around us too. You know, one thing, and then there's some other people I can call, I, are there other hands being raised, I think? This is an important differentiation, and this is, thank you, Pam, that's such a great story, and it highlights this too, but like, I was doing Tonglen for someone in my life who is like my recurring enemy <laughs> you know they're like the one i always practice with um and i have this suddenly I'm, I'm practicing with them and i get this image of of them being like an octopus like their energy is this kind of you know many arm just kind of like kind of like clinging energy and i thought and i and i was like oh wow i don't want to I don't want to breathe the octopus into my heart, you know, like, and I realized it's not, it's not that we have to let the octopus into the heart. It's that we have to be willing to breathe in the dynamic energy, their suffering, their dynamic, breathe in that, to be willing to turn towards that and breathe it in, transform it at the heart and breathe out healing or peace, whatever it is. We're not breathing the octopus into the heart. We're not bringing Angulimala or the enemies into the heart. It's not literal like that. It's that quality where I'm very much contained and protected within my orb of bodhicitta, like the Buddha. And with from that stance and from that place of clarity and composure, you know, I can breathe in, I can do this work without damaging myself or making myself sick or compromising myself. It's, it's an important distinction and I think it's a very empowering distinction. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Yes, go ahead. Mary. I, I had Hi. thought um, during the practice that uh, in a couple different circumstances with different people like that's a lot of suffering to take in yeah but then i thought yeah, i can do it you know um but uh that was my first initial thought of 
how much suffering the especially this one friend had, you know so um and you know brought about more compassion so thank you yeah yeah it's almost like our body regulates how much we can actually take in at least that's been my my experience over the years is you know, turn towards the maha the vast suffering but with each in breath it's just enough just the, the amount of the breath right like in, the intention is to breathe it all in, but in actuality, it's a little bit like a, a baby spoon amount, <laughs> you know, or, or or greater if the capacity is there. But there's almost a self-selection, a, a, a titration of it in a way that is a natural, you know. At least that's my experience. It sounds like, Mary, that's a bit what happened to you. And then there was a feeling of tenderness and compassion that arose from that intention to see what it felt like, right? Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? It dawned on me as we were doing this is, you know, they, this beautiful uh, clarification that the out breath is like metta, like a loving kindness, the giving. And the in breath is the compassion, it's the taking. And that, but that whole thing wrapped together, the taking and the receiving, the sending and receiving, the out breath, the in breath, the metta, the karuna, all of that is an act of generosity. Of course, the giving with the out breath of, you know, may you be free of suffering, may you experience peace, and so on. Of course, that's an obvious act of generosity, it's a giving. But the in breath is also a generous act because we're, we're, off, we're, we're offering to take, if, if, even if temporarily, taking that from them, peeling it off of them, vacuuming it up with the breath, transforming and then offering. And so that receiving is also a gift. And I'll never forget when I learned that a long time ago. Somebody said to me, Chandra, just receive the gift that I'm trying to give you. Don't be like, oh, no, you can't take it. You know? They said, you know, you, when you receive my gift, it is a gift for me. You're giving me that gift of receiving my gift. It's a gift. In the same way, this, this in-breath feels like that, like we're taking we're receiving their suffering gift, so to speak, but we're taking, we're offering to take that on for a bit. Not like take it on, you know. I want to be careful about that. We're not putting it on like an armor or a coat. We're breathing it into this incredibly capacitated, luminous, enlightened heart, mind. Nothing can be destroyed. Nothing can be hurt or changed there. And then we're offering that back out. So this is a practice of dana, generosity, right? Don't you think? Claudia, yeah, I think you're saying that you're muted. I can see you moving. No, I just <laughs> said compassion. Yes. There's three aspects of generosity in the classical teachings of the six paramitas, you know, the first perfection of the six perfections is generosity. And uh, the first is uh, offering of material things. So if somebody needs money, give them money or clothes or food or time, you know, more of the, the kind of foundational needs, material offering. The second is the gift of the dharma. So whether it's teaching, if you're a teacher, it's by giving teachings, or if, if you aren't a teacher, but you want to give some advice or some books or audio, you know, help sponsor someone to do a retreat. So giving the gift of Dharma is the second aspect. And the third aspect is freedom from fear, giving like protection from fear.
So that could be like helping someone in need, helping someone who's unhoused to have a roof over their head or protecting a child who's in an abusive family or it can be, you know, the whole thing. It can be donating to refugee um, nonprofits and humanitarian. It can be a lot of different things. It can be hugging your child who's afraid of something, of a nightmare, you know. But I think also that Donglan, this, this gift here of this freedom, this protection from fear could also be a bit like that, you know, that third aspect of giving. Yes, and all of that is suffused with compassion. Maybe one more comment or question, and then we'll go into the slogan. What is this chat coming in from Walt? Angulimala takes up the robe and is nonetheless pillared by many during the remainder of his life, but accepts this with equanimity and is said to have attained Nibbana. Nibbana. Nonetheless, pilloried, that's a new word. Is that, is that a typo or is that a real word? Pilloried. In any case, that's, yeah, that's beautiful. Thank you. Am I learning a new word? Help me here. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. <laughs> yeah, actually, it is, uh, it is a word. Uh, uh, back in, uh, back in um, uh, colonial times or medieval times, when they would put, lock people up in, in those, whatever they call them, you know, they'd lock their head up and their arms up oh. in the square. Then people, you know, people yeah. would throw things at them and beat them and, things like that. So anyway, that that allegedly supposedly happened to uh, Angulimala Mala because mm -hmm. of his past deeds, even though he was accepted as uh, a reformed, re repentant monk by the Buddha. And the mm -hmm. Buddha said, go with it. Because after all, think of all of the bad things that you have done in your life. And so he accepted it. And his equanimity and et cetera, you know, uh, supposedly led to him reaching the other side. Yeah. Interesting story. A very interesting story. Yeah, thank you. It reminds me of Milarepa, you know, I mean, the classic, the Buddha said there's no sin or, or misdeed that cannot be purified, even the worst. And like Milarepa, you know, he also murdered people through his black magic, and then he repented later and had to go undergo a lot of hardship and also is said to have achieved Nibbana. And um, it, it gives us hope, you know, those of us who may have uh, stumbled in our past and done things we don't feel good about, you know, there's nothing that can't be purified. Confession is used a lot in Buddhism, you know, during the sojong, you know, the feasts and the, the confession twice a month, the Buddha brought that in to the community practices because people needed it. <laughs> he found that the, the monks, you know, with all their rules were breaking the rules all the time by mistake or on purpose, but also lay practitioners with less vows, but, you know, stepping on an ant, you know, you could purify that. And so confession's a way to purify karma. Uh, compassion practices like Donglen actually are purifying as well. Resting in the nature of your own mind is said to be a very pure, is it's purifying. There's mantras that are purifying, like the hundred syllable mantra, Vajra Sattva, beautiful practice. Is, is done for the purpose of purifying negative karma. And within the recitation of the mantra, you're imagining that you, you know, you're, you're feeling remorse for any harm you've caused others, you regret and um, 
commitment to try not to do that again. You know, I mean, this is kind of our human nature. We need these types of ways of purifying our mistakes. And, uh, and even the worst can become enlightened. But the, you know, the sincerity has to be there, of course. It's so beautiful. Thank you, both of you, for bringing this very interesting story into the space. Yeah, there's the Angulimala Sutra that explains his, his whole life. Okay, so let's switch gears here in our last segment of our time together. We're on slogan number 45 of Lojong, Mind Training Slogans. There are 59, so we're, we're near the end. This one, it says, take on the three principal causes. Take on the three principal causes. Another way of translating that is um, foster three key elements. Uh, the Tibetan is gyu yi tso namsum lang. So gyu means causes. So here they're translating it as um, causes or elements. Gyu yi tso Yi is of, Tsowo is the root, the principle, the main. Namsum means the three. Lang means to foster or to take on, to adopt. So adopt the three root or the three principal causes. So what are they? They are the primary elements for practicing Dharma. And the first one is having a good teacher. Like a physician, we want a good teacher so that they can check in on us, adjust, you know, our lifestyle, diet, medications, you name it. So like that, a physician, a teacher is able to take your pulse, you know, not literally, but figuratively, and check in. How are you doing? How is your practice working on you? Maybe we need to adjust it or enhance it. So I thought I would read, okay, so I'll just name the three and then I'll un unpack each one. So the first of the three principal causes is having a good teacher. The second is having a good Dharma practice, being really engaged in body, uh, speech, and mind through your Dharma practice. More specifically, if you're a Lojong devotee, you know, mind training is your thing, then really, uh, deeply practicing lojong. I hope my kid's not being too loud. They don't have to hear him. Um, then the third is having suitable conditions for practicing the Dharma, meaning your life is set up so that you can actually practice Dharma. So the first one, good teacher. I have a book here that is such a wonderful kind of old time classic. It's called The Words of My Perfect Teacher should be in every uh, Dharma library, in my humble opinion, the words of my perfect teacher. It's a complete translation of a classic introduction to Tibetan Buddhism by Patrol Rinpoche, P-A-T-R-U-L Rinpoche, R-I-N-P-O-C-H-E, the words of my perfect teacher. There's a really good section on the teacher, like how do you find a good teacher? What are the qualities that a good teacher should have? How do you follow a good teacher? So in this section of the book, it talks about qualities of a good teacher. And I really think this is important because us in the West, we might not know that how important it is to really check out the teacher, you know, we might take one class with somebody and think, oh, they've got charisma, I love, love what they said, I'm going to be their student, and then we ask them to be our teacher. Hold on a sec. <laughs> I'm going to ask Tejas to be quiet. I think he forgot I'm teaching.
Okay, sorry about that. So the importance of finding a good teacher. There's a quote from this book that says, as the sick man relies on his doctor, the traveler on his escort, the frightened man on his companion, merchants on their captain, and passengers, passengers on their ferryman, if birth, death, and negative emotions are the enemies you fear, entrust yourself to a teacher. Right? And so it's said that the most important thing, that there's a whole, there are long lists of like what teachers should, should have, what qualities they should have, but first and foremost, teachers need to have bodhicitta. They need to have that compassionate heart, be free of self-centeredness, free of arrogance, free of uh, that type of greed and, and abuse of power tendencies. Stay away from those teachers. I think we all know that, but it's not uncommon <laughs> to fall into a mesmerizing trance around charismatic teachers who might not have the greatest bodhicitta or compassion. Another very important element of a good teacher is that they walk their talk, that they follow their own advice, that they in, inhabit the Dharma. They bring it to life through their own actions, not just their words. But that also a teacher needs to be well educated, needs to be well learned. They need to know the Dharma and put it into practice, right? So, um, in classical teachings, they should know the sutras and tantras. They should be well versed in different philosophy, different approaches to meditation and awakening. They should at least know more than you do, <laughs> right? They should at least know a little bit more than you do, at least. When I first started teaching, um, Alan Wallace, he's the one who said, okay, you go teach. I had been asked to teach it at the Cancer Center of Santa Barbara. I had never taught Dharma before. I was very nervous about it. And he said, don't worry. You know, you just have to know a little bit more than your students. <laughs> you just have to know a little bit more. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to be perfect. You just have to have bodhicitta, sincere interest and just know a little bit more than your, your students. So in that way, teachers are like a Kalyana Mitra, a spiritual friend, right? They're a guide, they're a friend, but they're not just like a friend. They are somebody who you respect, you look to for advice, especially when you get into more tantric uh, teachings it said that the guru is of utmost importance because in essence, they say the tantric path is like walking a knife's blade. If you fall, you fall into the hell realms <laughs> because they're really powerful teachings. Why do I say that? Well, in tantra, tantra we implement breath work, mantra, yogic practices even more kind of when you get farther along the path you may even learn sacred sexuality the transmuting desire sensory um, stimuli on the spiritual path so if your bodhicitta isn't in place you know if your wisdom isn't clear discernment clarity intelligence and your heart isn't in a good place the energy that is ignited from more yogic, tantric, alchemical practices can be so powerful that it can go astray and cause a lot of damage. So that's why the guru is very important and you just don't want any guru, you know, you need to really have one who has compassion, wisdom, integrity, and who is generous with their teachings, who can teach to people in their various capacities. I mean, it said even the Buddha taught in different languages according to the needs of his listeners. So the way that that can be understood in our day and age is that a teacher is adaptable and can speak to, appeal to 
different people depending on their capacities, their orientations, their needs, that they're versatile and that they're willing to meet you where you are. And then there's teachings on how to be a student, right? So that's kind of a general outline of like what we should be looking for in a teacher, let alone realization, which of course I didn't say, but I, that's just assumed that ultimately, hopefully, your teacher has realized the profundity of the teachings, or at least be very close to that. The truth is nowadays, those types of gurus are fewer and far between. It's a sign of our degenerate era, so to speak. But there are still teachers out there who are close, or at least who know a lot more than we do, right? So that we can be inspired by them. So really seek them out and don't commit to a teacher too soon. In Tantra, they say you should watch a teacher, check them out for three years, take their teachings, go to their retreats, read their books, whatever. Check them out for three years. If you still like them and feel that they have integrity after those three years, then tell them that you want to be their student and ask them if they'll take you as their student. Then they are supposed to watch you for three years, check you out. <laughs> Are you committed? Are you doing the practice? Are you sincere? Or are you just flaky, you know, as my yoga teacher would call, are you a shopper? <laughs> so they check you out for three years, that's six years in. And then for the next three years, once if that's still good, if the teacher's like, okay, you know, I see you've got potential, I can, there's good karma between us, I could take you on as a student. There's supposed to be another three years of mutual checking before the full commitment is made. Nine year process. So that gives us in the West a more kind of bigger perspective of like, oh yeah, I don't have to rush into choosing my teacher. Check them out. I think be a shopper for the first few years. <laughs> Shop around. Guard your integrity, you know, check in. But once you become a student, then what do we do? So in terms of this teacher category, being a student, there are three ways it's said to follow or serve a teacher. And the best way, the very best way is called the offering of practice. So we make the offering of putting their teachings, putting the Dharma into practice. So whatever she teaches, you put it into practice with determination, with commitment. That is the greatest offering you could give to a teacher. I love that. Then the middling way is serving the teacher with body, speech, and mind. So donating your time, you know, helping them, serving them in some way, you know, it feels integral to you where your talents lie, you know, students might transcribe teachings or organize retreats or, you know, sew clothes or clean their house or make them food or, you know, there's kind of all these traditional ways that students would support their teacher. So serving with body, speech and mind, that's kind of more of the middling way. And then the lowest way is to offer material things, material goods, food, money, housing, and so on. That those are wonderful offerings, but they're not considered the most important way to study, to follow, to serve a teacher. That's interesting, isn't it? So on page 145, I have a quote. There are three ways to please the teacher and serve her. The best way is known as offering of practice and consists of putting whatever he, he or she teaches into practice with determination, disregarding all hardship. The middling way is known as service with the body and speech and mind and involves serving her and doing whatever she needs you to do 
whether physically, verbally, or mentally. Now, of course, that's within integrity. We don't just blindly do whatever, uh, you know, I think you know what I mean. The lowest way is by making material offerings, which means to please your teacher by giving her material goods, food, money, and so forth. So this is all really coming from devotion, right? So if you have devotion towards a teacher, you want to support them, you want to help them. You may, you really want to be around them so you can bask in their glow, learn from them. It's a beautiful gift. And the teacher-student relationship can be a very wonderful relationship when both parties have integrity, bodhicitta, patience, generosity, and so on. So now the second uh, element or principal cause that we long, that we take on, is this really sincerely practicing the Dharma. And having a, a malleable or a, a, an adjustable, like a workable mind, meaning that you come not hardened with strong opinions and closed-minded, but you're open, you're curious, and your mind is workable. And then the third aspect is uh, having suitable conditions for Dharma practice. And there are outer and inner aspects of this. So on the outer level, it means having the three aspects of food, shelter, and spiritual friends, spiritual community. Whether you live with them or you can call them, just people around you, Sangha, that support you in your practice these basic human needs. And then the inner aspect is faith, intelligence, and perseverance or zeal. And of course, faith comes through learning, through contemplation, through meditation. Faith is not a blind faith. It's a faith that comes when you have really like the Buddha said, not just accepted the teachings for, for their, you know, for acceptance sake, or because the Buddha said it, or somebody you respect said it, but actually like a nugget of gold, check it, bite on it, clean it off, see if it's really real gold. Same with the Dharma teachings. And that act of doing that, that perseverance, that commitment to authenticity and integrity within your own being, that brings an unshakable faith that nobody can take away from you. And then, of course, intelligence means you're discerning, you're questioning. You really value the mind so that then you can transcend the mind, but that you have a sense of clarity, that you understand the teachings. And not just understand them up here, but understand them in here. And then zeal is a very interesting word. It's the Tibetan is tsundru, or the Sanskrit is virya. Virya. And it, I know the Tibetan etymology means enthusiastic effort. <laughs> but virya in Sanskrit also means vigor. So it's this enthusiastic effort towards practicing the Dharma. And I'm not just talking about sitting on a cushion and entering into samadhi for hours on end. When we say practice the Dharma, we mean be compassionate, be a good human being. Avoid non-virtue and practice virtue. You know, is Dharma making you a better person? If you've been with a teacher for so long, but you don't feel like you're really benefiting or you're evolving, maybe you should check that teacher. Same thing with practice. If you've been at a practice for a long time, but you still don't feel that, you know, you've had some maturity or growth, then maybe it's time to try something different. Listen to your body. Listen to the enteric nervous system, the gut, you know. This is a, this is, this should be another way to find a good teacher. What does your gut say? <laughs> Same with Sangha. Does this Sangha feel wholesome and supportive for me or does it feel destructive or negative? 
And then same with your shelter, your food, your spiritual friends, your environment, the conditions for Dharma practice. Is it nourishing you? Is it supporting you on the path? Or is it time to say goodbye? I rem never forget this when I was younger in college. I lived in a house with my roommates. They were fun, cool, artsy people, but they did a lot of drugs and they smoked cigarettes. And I was pulled into that. And then I started getting into Dharma and yoga. And I wanted to quit smoking. I couldn't quit while I was still with them. I had to move out, get my own place, find my center again. And then every time I wanted a cigarette, well, I did various things, but I would do yoga. I would meditate because I noticed that the cigarette was the clink, the craving. It was more of a superficial craving. But what I was really craving was wholeness, was peace, was myself. So yoga helped me. Meditation helped me. But I had to get out of that non-supportive environment. So sometimes that's very real. Sometimes we think, oh, I should be okay. I should be able to overcome this. Not always. Sometimes we literally need to change scenery. So it's good to know when that is. And one way to understand that is to check in with your gut. The enteric nervous system senses things way before the mind, the brain senses things. And there are more neurons in the enteric nervous system than there are in the brain. So that's been my kind of mantras. Listen to my body. And this, this is applicable with all of these. Take on the three principal causes, but don't take on just any of them, right? You have to really make sure you're taking on the right ones that are good for you. And then this, the teachings take this a little further in terms of like the whole Lojong approach, which is if all of these are available to you, take joy in that and pray that they are available to others as well. And if they're not available to you, meditate on compassion for others and take on yourself the defi deficiency that all beings experience in these primary elements. This is so interesting. This is taking on, taking the joys and transmuting the sorrow as well as the joy. Remember, some of you may have been here at the class where I sang that Tibetan song of of um, mind training song of um, taking all joys and sorrows onto the path. There's a line in there. If I am sick, I am happy because I take on all the illness of all beings and I purify it through my experience of illness. May all beings be free of illness and disease. So we're not literally taking on the illness of the world, but we're transforming our own heart by saying, may my individual experience of illness be an opportunity to heal, not just myself, but others. So they use the same thinking here, this is so Lojong. This is so Dharma, but so uniquely mind training. So if you don't have these, rather than being jealous or angry, Actually feel compassion, cultivate compassion for all beings who might be experiencing the same lack that you do. And pray that you and all beings may have them someday. So you're not alone in this deficiency. You're finding yourself within the greater family. You're not isolated. Isn't that interesting? Isn't this revolutionary? 
This is a real like revolution. Now I'm not saying go out and take on all the suffering of everybody on the street that you meet, okay? I just want, I hope that's just super duper clear. This is within the lab of our own mind, right? Our meditative lab. What is it like to make that prayer? Really check. So if you have it, rejoice and offer it up. May all beings experience this. If you don't have it, with compassion, wish that all beings like yourself who, who are experiencing uh, you know, a lack of spiritual, mental, or abundance, or sangha, that may you all, may, may you in a sense kind of like purify that for all beings and may we all have that. It's like through the gestalt of your experience, you are helping others to heal. May, and then pray, may we all have these. The gift of a teacher, the gift of Dharma practice, the gift of community, food, shelter, spiritual friends, faith, intelligence, and zeal. May we all have that. Okay, lastly, the final comment I have about like the teacher, ultimately, a good teacher will point out your Buddha nature and help you realize it. Remember, G, you are you. That's how you spell guru. A good guru will point back at you and say, you are the guru. <laughs> you are Buddha. Not be like, oh, only I'm the Buddha in the room and all of you measly, miserable, downtrodden people just need to stay over there. You know, that's, no. Watch out for that. A good teacher will point out your Tathagata Garbha, your Buddha nature, and help you realize it. Oh, I hope that that was uh, useful for you, that you could take something from that and put it into practice. Uh, I'm not pretending to be one of those gurus, you know, I'm more of like your friend teacher who knows a little more than you do. <laughs> I could be your Kalyana Mitra. Um, but I'm still walking this path. And I like to think about it and talk about it. So for some reason, I'm a teacher. <laughs> it's my karma. I love teaching because it helps me stay engaged and continue to learn. And then it helps me to give back. I love giving the gift of Dharma. It brings me a lot of joy. So thank you for showing up so that I can keep giving the gift of Dharma. But by no means am I ever claiming to be a guru. Guru is a whole other level. <laughs> I have a friend who's a tulku. He was a recognized reincarnated Lama, Tibetan man. His father was a tulku, a guru, his father's father, you know, is deep in his family line. But he let it go. He became a contractor. <laughs> and I asked him, why did you let it go? And he said, oh, too much responsibility. <laughs> He knew himself. He knew that he wasn't up for it. And then he said, and he said something I'll never forget. He said, being a guru is like carrying all of your students' karmas on your back, on your back up a mountain. You know, it's a huge responsibility. And so you've got to have deep practice and realization and bodhicitta in order to really do that. I thought, wow. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, right. I'm not a guru. I'm a spiritual friend. Different. In the Tibetan tradition, it's more tantric and the whole understanding where you really do take on 
But it's true, as a teacher, you are responsible to have integrity. And that's very important, and I take that seriously. But I'm sorry, I'm not carrying your karma up the mountain. <laughs> let's just let's just put that out there right now. <laughs> oh, I'm joking. Uh, well, I appreciate you guys. And um, I wouldn't mind if you gave the supreme gift of putting Dharma into practice. So please do that. And that means for the month of July, for the most part. So we'll be back at the, I think, is it August 4th we're coming back, Noah? It's that first Wednesday of August, I think. I can do that. I'll do that. You know, if Eve can't do it, I can do it. But hopefully Eve will come around. We all miss Eve, too. And um, we'll see you in August. So put the Dharma into practice. Sandra, I just wanted to say one thing is the video, video recorders that on the website there's lots of catch-up sessions that you can do if you've missed any that's a great point yeah every slogan right every week they're all there so or at least we hope so but check out the website and maybe on wednesday just dive into another session that's a great idea and if you want to do you could self-organize and get together and do it too you know i don't know how that would happen but maybe if you know each other you could support each other if you have each other's contact you could do that so genevieve is asking will you post the link to the recordings yeah so they're on uh, the sfdc uh, youtube channel so go to youtube and type in san francisco dharma collective and you'll find their channel you should subscribe to that and then you'll find all of ours, but you'll also find, I think, most, if not all the other teachers' videos, too. 